surface covering. Stagnation of the air in these regions is common. Also, certain large water areas in the tropical regions meet the requirements for source regions, and characteristic air masses develop there. During the period of stabilization and accumulation of air north of the front, warm, moist air approaches the polar front, from converging with and rising over cold, dry, heavy air from the northeast. When, due to various causes, the cold air mass has pushed a section of the front ahead of the general boundary, a salient of this cold, dry air is created, which obstructs the advance of the warm, moist air from the southwest, creating a low-pressure area to the east of the outbreak. This is accentuated by the fact that the southwest winds in this region to the east of the low-pressure area are being deflected to the east by the Earth's rotation. Thus, wherever two winds meet in this manner, both being deflected to the right, the area of low pressure, which was started by the obstruction to the flow of the warm air, will be intensified. The region within and behind the salient is inherently a region of high pressure. The low pressure area forms at the crest of the wave salient. High pressure to the west is due to the density of the cold winds from the northeast, their forward momentum toward the southwest, and the damming up of the winds from the southwest. Air continues flowing in from the north, and continuously increasing pressure back of the polar front reinforces the momentum of the southward moving cold air mass. It will also be urged of the low pressure area to the right. This latter force is opposed by the deflecting forces of the Earth's rotation, which urge it to the west. As the process progresses and the lower pressure area becomes intensified, the west to east force increases. The north to south component decreases as the air mass moves further from its source. The deflective force due to Earth's rotation decreases as the mass moves toward lower latitudes. The cold air mass, therefore, gradually shifts more and more toward the east as it reaches lower latitudes. and acquires a component of motion toward this boundary. The boundary is called a cold front, the term being defined as a boundary along which cold air is advancing. Warm air is moving away from this front and toward this boundary. Which is thus known as the warm front. It advances against and rises over the cold air ahead of the front. The cold front is colored blue on the weather map. The warm front is shown in red. With the wave as a whole, a dynamic component tends to continue the motion eastward in a manner similar to the propagation of waves through water or any other elastic medium. As circulation about the low pressure area becomes more pronounced, the cold front overtakes the warm front. Cold air is advancing more nearly perpendicular to the cold front and changes the shape of the wave since it meets a yielding opposition of the warm air moving away from it. Whereas the advance of the warm front is effected against the opposition of the cold air which has a component of velocity toward this front.
going back to the early stages in the formation of a wave and viewing a vertical section along this line, we have cold, dry, northeasterly winds on the west side and warm, moist, westerly winds east of the boundary. The heavy air will underrun the lighter, warm, moist air in the form of a wedge, lifting the warm, moist air above it. At first, there is little motion of the cold air normal to the front, therefore little advance of the front, and only slight lifting of the warm air and relatively few clouds. But as the motion of the cold air shifts more toward normal to the front, the cold front advances more rapidly. There is more rapid lifting and expansion with resultant cooling of the warm, moist air. More clouds are formed, ultimately developing precipitation. A vertical section on this line across the warm front shows us the front advancing slowly, southeasterly winds ahead of the front and southwesterly winds behind it. The air masses on both sides are moving away from us. Lifting and expansion of the warm moist air takes place as it overruns the cold air ahead. In the case of a well-developed wave such as this, the lifting and expansion are sufficient to develop clouds and precipitation. Clouds may be cumulus with heavy rains, as here, or stratus, that is, sheet form, with steady light rain. Lifting of the warm air at a warm front is accomplished by its own momentum and is called an active upglide. The cold air wedge is retreating before the advance of the warm air. The slope is less steep than on the cold front. On a cold front, the cold air wedge advances, underrunning the warm air and forcing it upward in what is called a passive upglide. The slope is steeper. More rapid expansional cooling takes place and thick cumuloform clouds are developed which are frequently associated with heavy intermittent showers. Omitting for a moment the winds, clouds and precipitation, let us observe the progress of a typical wave across the continent. The forces of convection have built up an air mass along the polar front which breaks out and moves southward. It acquires a component of motion toward the east, which increases with the development of the wave until finally its energy is spent. Such outbreaks are subject to great variation in intensity and in direction. Reviewing now the development of this atmospheric wave and observing more closely the distribution of its cloud formations, we see clouds forming in advance of the warm front. In the early stages, owing to the absence of any marked convergence of winds on the cold front, there is little lifting and expansion, and no clouds are visible there. As the cycle advances, clouds spread over a larger area along the warm front and begin to appear along the cold front. There is precipitation over an extended area along the warm front, which for technical reasons is not here shown. No clouds have appeared on the warm sector as there is no lifting process in operation there. There are now intermittent showers along the cold front. Clouds are spreading farther ahead of the warm front, reaching to a distance of several hundred miles. Still farther in advance of the front, there will be high, thin, whitish veils called cirrus or cirrostratus.
As the cold front overtakes the warm front in the manner previously described, the wave enters an unstable state as a sharp break appears near the crest. The overtaking continues with increasing intensity of all phenomena heretofore observed. until finally the warm air is lifted off the ground by the two underlying layers of cold air. This process is known as occlusion. That part of the wave boundary between the two cold sectors where the warm air has been lifted is called the occluded front. It is here shown by a dotted line extending southward from the center of the low pressure area. The former warm front boundary now marks in a general way the boundary east of which heavy precipitation occurs. The wave continues, moving generally eastward with the characteristics described until the forces which created it are spent and their energy dissipated. This portion of the weather map of March 14th, 1939 shows a wave with its crest in the low pressure area west of Chicago. The wave is just breaking into the unstable state. The warm front, represented by the dotted line, extends east from Illinois out into the Atlantic Ocean. Twelve hours later, the occluded front reaches from Lake Michigan almost to Lake Erie. The cold front, shown by the lighter solid line, has advanced about 300 miles. Again, 12 hours later, the occluded front has lengthened and reaches from the vicinity of Lake Superior almost to New York City. The warm and cold fronts have advanced as shown. On March 16th, 48 hours after the occlusion first started forming, it has moved northeast and increased until it reaches from Hudson Bay to about Portland, Maine. 